Okay, well, welcome back to our study in 1 Chronicles. We will be in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 this morning as we have reached the end point of at least 1 Chronicles. Still a whole other book out there. But we will be taking a break and jumping back into Psalms next week as we pick up with book 3 of Psalms. But today we're going to finish out this great chapter and this great book. But before we do, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for another day that you've given us to come together to open your word to study these truths. We pray you'll teach us this morning and that you would help us to live these truths out. And it would be all for your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And just as a quick summary here on the chapter, I break it down into four different sections. The first nine verses we're going to see is about the giving for the temple. We are then going to move to David's prayer, and it's a fascinating prayer to study. And I think it's always beneficial to study the great prayers of the great men of the Bible. They provide us an example of how to pray. They, they model for us uh, what our prayer life should look like. And then we're going to see in verses 20 through 25 that Solomon is enthroned as the king of Israel. And then we finish out this chapter and... With that, we also finish out the book with a summary, a very, very brief uh, summary of the life of David. So with that, let's jump into this last chapter. And recall as we move through this chapter, the two kind of big themes that we've had through First Chronicles. One is temple worship. The Levites played a major role in that, and we see that the temple has played a major role. And the second theme that we have seen is the idea of David's throne, which is really founded on the Davidic covenant. And those two elements, I think, come together to, to end this book and to move us from the life of rule of David to the life and rule of Solomon, which picks up in 2 Chronicles. So 1 Chronicles chapter 29 Verse 1 says, Then King David said to the entire assembly, So now we have David addressing the leaders of Israel. And he says, My son Solomon, who alone God has chosen, is still young and inexperienced, and the work is great, for the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. So David has assembled these leaders. He's going to address them. And he has a particular concern, and we've seen this before, and that is Solomon. And notice how Solomon is described there. He is chosen of the Lord. Solomon is the man who the Lord has picked to succeed David, to carry on that Davidic covenant. And David says that he is young and he's inexperienced. And we made a note of this before, but... Solomon is probably only about 20 years old at this point, so still young for a king. And he is inexperienced. He does not have uh, the experiential knowledge, the knowledge that's built on experience that he needs to be able to rule over the kingdom of Israel. And for one big important task that we've been building up this entire, or not entire, but a large chunk of this book, First Chronicles, and that is the building of the temple. And Solomon even recognizes this. and So this is not a kind of a dig at Solomon by David here. Solomon, in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, in speaking to the Lord, the Lord asks him, What do you want? And he says, Give me now wisdom and, and, and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can rule this great people of yours? So even Solomon recognizes in and of himself that to be this great king, he needs more than what he has. He needs uh, the knowledge of the Lord. He needs the wisdom of the Lord. And David recognizes this. And again, David's looking at this temple project. And he says, for the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. So David doesn't want just, just any old temple built. He wants this magnificent structure that's going to honor the creator of the heavens and earth. So he, he, he prays for Solomon. He, he requests for Solomon to be strengthened by the Lord, but also that the people will come alongside him as well. 
So he says in verse 2, Now with all my ability I have provi provided for the house of my God the gold for the things of gold, and the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, and iron for the things of iron, and wood for the things of wood, onyx stones and inlaid stones, stones of antimony, and stones of various colors, and all kinds of precious stones and alabaster in abundance. So David now reminds the people that he has provided many of the resources to build this great temple. David is not allowed to build it, as we have seen, but he's providing as much as he can. Now, the provision here in verse 2 probably is part of his treasure as king part of the resources he has available as the king of Israel. And he says, I have provided, or I have caused, it's a hifil in Hebrew, so I have caused to provide. So he's probably using state funds, which he could as king. He has, he has given as much as possible. And the reason I say that is because in verse 3 it says, Moreover, in my delight in the house of my God, the treasure I have of gold and silver. So we have the provision in verse 2, but we also have additional provision. The provision of verse 3. And this seems to be from his personal. So there seems to be, again, don't want to be dogmatic here, but there seems to be this state treasure that David technically probably owns as king, but he also has a personal treasure as well. So he says, the treasure I have of gold and silver, I give to the house of my God, over and above all that I've already provided for the holy temple. Now again, this could be all David's and he's, he's given before, now he's giving again and he's, he's saying it in this way, or it could be two different sources of income. We don't want to be dogmatic. But what we do know here is David has provided quite a bit of resources already. We've studied that. But at this time, in speaking to the assembly, he's going above and beyond that and giving even more. And there's a reason. Because he wants these people, this assembly of Israelites, to give out of their own possession. And it, it parallels somewhat the building of the tabernacle during Moses' day. The, the materials just didn't appear out of nowhere. People gave those resources for the tabernacle to be built. And David, in order to help Solomon because of his youth and his inexperience, is going to go to the people and ask for contributions. Now, what is David giving in addition? Well, we see that in verse 4. Namely, 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, which uh, scholars are not certain exactly where that's at. It's probably somewhere either in Africa or Arabia. It was well known for its gold. And by the way, 3,000 talents is a roughly about a 110 tons, you know, give or take, probably anywhere from 100 to 110 tons. Now, it's hard to assess the value of that, but I would say that it's probably in hundreds of millions of dollars. And then it says, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the buildings. So 7,000 talents would be probably you know, 200 plus tons, almost maybe 300 tons. Again, probably hundreds of millions of dollars. And it's for the overlaying the walls of the building. So this thing is going to be magnificent. And again, it goes back to David's point in verse 1. This is not a house for man. This is a house for the Lord. So he's going to go all out to make that happen. So verse 5, of gold for the things of gold and of silver for the things of silver. That is for all the work done by the craftsmen. And then based off that point, his giving and his additional giving, he asks a question, a rhetorical question. He says, Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? So David, is, as a leader, has taken responsibility to walk the walk. He has set the example for the people to follow. This is not a king who says, I want everyone to give, and he hasn't given himself. He has set the example. Now he wants the people to follow along. But he's not going to force it. He says he wants them to be willing to consecrate themselves. And notice there, it's an interesting way of stating that. He doesn't just come out and say, I want you to give from your resources. I want you to give your gold 
your silver, your stones, whatever you have available, brass, iron. What does he say? He wants them to consecrate themselves. Possibly the idea here is that if the people are right with the Lord, they're going to give. He doesn't have to force the issue. He wants them right with the Lord. He wants, he wants them to have hearts with integrity. And that's actually going to be an important part of that prayer that, we're, that um, I have on the outline that we're going to see in just a minute. So the, all of this is willing. This is not the king going through and going door to door and saying, you know, taxes are due. Pay your share. Because David is a spiritual ruler. He understands the purpose of giving. He understands the purpose of this temple project. So what is the response of the people? Well, verse 6 says, Then the rulers of the fathers' households and all the princes of the tribes of Israel and of the commanders of thousands and of hundreds with the overseers over the king's work offered willingly. And notice again the focus on willingness. They offered willingly. Not under compulsion. And there seems to be a principle there that, co that crosses dispensational lines as in the age of the church, we don't force people to give. It should be giving willingly. So what did they give? Verse 7, And for the surface of the house of God, they gave 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold. So probably roughly 190 tons, again, plus or minus, depending on what scales you use. Probably hundreds of millions of dollars, though. Now, derricks are, people debate what kind of measure that is. It possibly could be a Persian measure, which would make sense that the readers are from that time period. Probably, you know, again, plus or minus 185 or so uh, pounds. And then it says, and 10,000 talents of silver, roughly 375 tons. 18,000 talents of brass, probably about 675 tons. And 100,000 talents of iron, which that works out, again, plus or minus a few, few tons. 3,750 tons. And it's hard to, to value what brass and iron would be at that point, but this is extensive. This is a large amount of resources, extremely valuable. And again, they, they offer this willingly, the people. Off of David's example, we have a tremendous giving to the ministry of the temple. And verse 8 continues, Whoever possessed precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in care of Jahael the Gershonite. So not only giving gold and silver and bronze, but the precious stones as well. Possibly even for the high priest. You think about his ephod and the stones he used. And then verse 9, Then the people rejoiced because they had offered so willingly, for they made their offering to the Lord with a whole heart. So the people allowed this to be a time of celebration in their own lives, a time of rejoicing, a time of great joy, because they were allowed to give. And again, it was willingly. These people went above and beyond. But again, not under compulsion, but because they wanted to. Sometimes we don't necessarily have that attitude. You know, we give, it's like, oh, okay, here we go. But they were excited to give. And again, I think that principle carries over. I think Paul even talks about that. Giving with what? A cheerful heart. And these people are doing that. A good example for church age believers. And notice they did it with a whole heart, a complete heart. So, this was again, this was an internal motive of the people. This wasn't David forcing it upon his subjects. But in seeing this, it brings great joy to David's heart as well. And King David also rejoiced greatly. He saw his people responding to the Lord. They obviously consecrated themselves, and in the result of that consecration was this tremendous giving. And it brought great happiness to David. And I'm sure Dr. Belleville has seen this when 
he was president, and I know I've experienced this, it's a different feeling that when you're responsible for something and someone gives, it's like, wow, that's an encouragement. That's, that's, a, that's a tremendous provision. And then there's just a, there's a joy there that you have as the one responsible that's not there when you're not responsible. So maybe you can say amen to that or not. I don't know. It's, it's uh, to see the Lord's people doing His work. And whether it's through giving or whether it's through giving of prayers or giving of other resources, time, whatever it may be, it brings joy to the leader's heart. So with that, with that provision, now we move into this prayer of David. Starting in verse 10. So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, so again, the same occasion, the people are gathered together. David implores them to consecrate themselves. And the result is this great provision for the temple. Again, for Solomon. And after that, David now goes to the Lord in prayer. And it says, David blessed the Lord. And we always talk about the Lord blessing us, or we ask the Lord to bless us. But there's times in Scripture where the people actually bless God. Interesting thought to think about. So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. So he starts this prayer with a, a focus on the Lord. And he says, verse 11, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth. And this is where I think that model prayer comes in. David teaches us how to pray here. Just by having this prayer recorded. And notice what, the, what David is doing. He's focused on the attributes of God. He's focused on who God is. He is great. He has the power. He has glory or, or beauty. It's not our typical word for glory, but so it could be something like beautiful or beauty. And He has the victory and He has the majesty. So He's seeing God for who He is, that He is the Creator of all things. And that's why I think He adds that note, everything that is in the heavens and the earth. And He takes us further to focus on God's sovereignty when He says, Yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. So there's nothing greater than God Himself. Everything added up in creation still does not equal to the greatness of God. He is over all. He is the most powerful. So this is where we think about His omnipotence, His sovereignty, He is focused on who God is. But he also focuses on what God does. Look at verse 12. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. And in your right hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now, keep this prayer in context. We just came off of the section of all these people of Israel, these leaders, giving abundantly. So David's recognizing that the giving of the people is not just due to the people in and of themselves. The giving is because the Lord is working in their midst. He is the one, ultimately, who is the source of this giving. I, I see a very similar, again, trans-dispensational principle when Paul talks uh, there in Philippians. It's God who wills and works in a person. You know, we're, we're called to be responsible. We're called, called to be engaged in His Word, to read it, to study it. We're called to be in prayer, to fellowship with one another, to walk in righteousness, to be filled by the Spirit, not to quench the Spirit. We have a lot of responsibilities. So it's, our spiritual life is not one where we just sit back and let God do everything. We have an active role in that. But we also recognize the results are of the Lord. Because in and of ourselves, we would just be a, a fish flung, flopping around in the water. 
We are responsible to do certain things, but the results we praise God for. And it's the same thing here. These people were to be responsible to consecrate themselves and to give. But David recognizes the true source. The true source of the results is the Lord Himself. And because of that, he can say in verse 13, Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. We just came off the Thanksgiving holiday. Hopefully there was a lot of thanksgiving to go around. But ultimately we thank God for who He is and what He does. And David recognized that same, that same truth. Especially in light of who we are, verse 14 says, But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from you, and from your hand we have given you. So he recognizes again the, the finiteness of man. That man is limited. But behind man is the infinite God. And he continues this thought in verse 15. For we are sojourners before you, and tenants as all our fathers were. Our days on earth are like a shadow, and there is no hope. Very similar to other scriptures that we have seen in the Old Testament. For example, in Leviticus 25, 23, it says, The land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are but aliens and sojourners with me. So there's this principle throughout the Old Testament that the land, even though God has given it to the Israelites, the land is the Lord's. And probably a good principle there to think about Israel and the land today. Who gets to decide who owns the land? Or who is in possession of the land right now? Is it the UN? Is it the U.S. government? No, it's the Lord's and He's going to give it to who He wants. And what He said is that it's Israel's land. And that's the reality because He can say that because it's His land. And as David says, they're just sojourners. They're just tenants. And he says, our days on earth are like a shadow and there's no hope. Now, don't read too much into that. This is poetry for one, but keep it, keep it in its context. Verse 14, but who am I and who are my people? So David is just saying this in, the, in, in, in light of who God is and who man is. Without God, our days are just a shadow on earth and there's no hope. So he's not saying there's no hope of salvation or afterlife or resurrection or anything like that. He's just making the point is that we're not in control. We're not the source of abundance and treasures and possessions. It's the, the land and the earth is not of our own doing. It's the Lord's. And He's the source of all things. Without Him, we would have nothing. So we come to the climax, I think, of this prayer in verse 16. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided to build you a house for your holy name, it is from your hand, and all is yours. All is yours. So they give, David gives, but he recognizes it is because of the goodness of the Lord. So David says in verse 17, Since I know, O Lord, uh, since I know, O my God, that you try the heart and delight in uprightness. I, in the integrity of my heart, have willingly offered all these things. So now with joy I have seen your people who are present here make their offers willingly to you. So again, David recognizes the heart is an essential part of all of this giving. Without the willingness of the people and the people to be rightly motivated, the giving would be in vain. The build, even the building of the temple, in a sense, would be in vain. It's one thing to force someone to do something, but it's totally different when they're willing to do it. And in verse 18, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers preserve this forever in the intentions of the heart of your people and direct their heart to you. So David here asked God for two things. Number one, to preserve this willingness, I think, in context 
other people to give and to bless. Preserve that in them. And number two, to direct their hearts. Direct their hearts to the Lord. And then in verse 19, another request is asked for by David, but this time it's not for the people, but for Solomon. And give to my son Solomon a perfect heart to keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, and to do them, and to do them all, and to build the temple for which I have made provision. So David wants Solomon to have a heart that is dedicated to serving God. And in this case, it would be keeping the Mosaic law, which I think is clear from the use of the word commandments, testimonies, and statutes. And this is important for all the, all the Israelites, but especially for Solomon as the king. Because remember in Deuteronomy 17, it says, Now it shall come about when he sits on the throne, this would be a king of Israel, of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. So David prays for Solomon's heart here. So once again, that idea that we are responsible, in this case Solomon is responsible to walk in integrity of the Mosaic law. But David also recognizes that the Lord is the one who has to work in and through him, or it will not come about. And David also, in addition to walking faithfully, he wants Solomon to finish this building project. David has put a lot of effort and resources into getting it to this point. So David wants Solomon to be successful. So he prays for the, to the Lord that Solomon will build the temple. So when we finish up David's prayer here, now we move to the actual enthronement of Solomon. So verse 20 says, Then David said to all the assembly, Now, now bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed low and did homage to the Lord and to the king. Verse 21, On the next day they made sacrifices to the Lord and offered burnt offerings to the Lord, 1,000 bulls, 1,000 rams, 1,000 and 1,000 lambs, with their drink offerings and all sacrifices in abundance for all of Israel. So the next day after the assembly and they have given, David has this great prayer. It's a time of sacrifice and we see 3,000 animals sacrificed. Quite the offering there. We see the drink offering provided. But notice the last part of verse 21. This was done for all Israel. And that is a theme, um, uh, kind of a sub-theme that we've seen through First Chronicles, this unification of Israel. So verse 22, So they ate and drank that day before the Lord with great gladness. So this was probably some type of celebration festival where they all get together, they eat of the sacrifices. This is all done before the Lord. They have great gladness. They have great happiness. And then verse 22 says, And they made Solomon the son of David king a second time, and they anointed him as ruler for the Lord, and Zadok as priest. Now the interesting, so they, the, so they make Solomon the king here, but notice they say they make him a king a second time. Now there's, don't know exactly what's going on here. It could, I think, be one of two things. First, we've already seen David making Solomon king. Back in 1 Chronicles 23.1 it says, Now when David reached old age, he made his son Solomon king over Israel. The thought is, is this was about two years prior to this event here in 1 Chronicles 29. So David was co-ruler with his son Solomon for two years. And that is quite possible. The second possibility here is an incident that occurred at the beginning of 1 Kings, where Adonijah, uh, David's son, decided to try to take the throne himself instead of Solomon. So we see in 1 Kings 1, 34 and 35, let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there as king over Israel and blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. 
And then you, sh you shall come up after him, and he shall come up and sit on my throne and be king in my place. For I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. So again, there was this plot to make Adonijah king instead of Solomon. And David gets word of it. He makes this plan to make sure Solomon is anointed and made king before Adonijah. And notice here it's Zadok who is the priest. Abiathar that we have seen quite a bit in 1 Chronicles. If you remember, we talk about usually Zadok and Abiathar, kind of two high priests of Israel. Well, Abiathar is not here in 1 Kings 1, 34 and 35. That's because he aligned himself with Adonijah. And that's why I think the note there at the end, if this is re referencing this, is that Zadok, Zadok is also anointed as the priest to signify Zadok's loyalty to Solomon. So either one of these, I think, two scenarios, or possibly even both, is true here. But the Chronicler does not get into all of this rebellion that is seen in 1 Kings chapter 1. You can read that another day. Because that's not part of his plan and purposes for the book of 1 Chronicles. He's focusing on the temple and the worship associated with it and the Levitical priests. And he's focused on this idea of the Davidic covenant and the Davidic throne. So verse 23, Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father, and he prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. And all the officials, the mighty men, and also the sons of the king of King David pledged allegiance to King Solomon. The Lord highly exalted Solomon in the sight of what? Of all Israel, and bestowed on him royal majesty, which had not been on any king before him in Israel. Now that's interesting. Now there's not too many kings before Solomon. We have Saul and we have David. So you might not think that means very much. But think about it. He exalted Solomon even above David. As great as David was exalted at the beginning of Solomon's reign, he is greater than David in a sense. Now there's another one who's even greater than Solomon. We'll get to that in just a second. So let's finish it out with that last section, the life of David. Verse 26, Now David the son of Jesse reigned over all Israel. The period which he reigned over Israel was forty years. He reigned in Hebron seven years, and in Jerusalem thirty-three years. Then he died in a ripe old age, full of days, riches and honor, and his son Solomon reigned in his place. So David has made provision. He has brought uh, peace to the and prosperity to the kingdom through war. He has prepared everything for the temple to be built. And his, his, his time and his purposes are done. And he dies at a ripe old age full of days. And there's some Hebrew alliteration going on there, which is fun in Hebrew. You can check that out. And Solomon takes the throne. And the chronicler ends the book with a note. Now the Acts of King David from first to last are written in the Chronicles of Samuel the Sire, Seer, in the Chronicles of Nathan the prophet, and in the Chronicles of Gad the Seer. Probably first Samuel at least, and possibly even second Samuel, between Nathan and Gad. With all his reign, his power, and the circumstances which came on him, which came on him, on Israel and all the kingdoms of the lands. So the Chronicler is very faithful to put forth this history based on at least we see three sources here. And I think that's a reminder that the Chronicler was faithful in recording these events in Israel's history and then he, he did it in order to what? To share it. And remember this is the post-exile generation. He's sharing these, these teachings, these events with the people. And recall, these are the people who have come back from Babylon, who have seen or at least read through the, probably or at least know of the history of Israel. They know the build-up and then the downfall. The northern kingdom being exiled in 722 B.C., the southern kingdom being exiled to Babylon in 586 B.C. And the chronicler is coming along and he's rehearsing this history to encourage the people Yes, you've been through a lot. The nation has been through a lot. It is divided. 
It has been ransacked. The temple was destroyed. But there are still great times ahead because of this great Davidic promise. And that's what they need to hold to. So the Chronicler is faithful in blessing the people by sharing this truth. And I think in the same way, God has given us His truth. And we need to be responsible. It's almost a, a, a responsibility. It's almost as if you know, we are blessed to have this. Why just keep it um, in and among ourselves? Our responsibility is to share it and to share it as much as possible. And that's the purpose of what we do here as a school, is to train up others to go teach His Word to other people. That is the heart of the mission at Tyndale, is to see His Word go out, not just through us. We don't want to just be the teachers and everyone come to us and be like, oh, we just going to get it from you. We want to train up others so that they can go out and fulfill that same responsibility. So, the Chronicler is responsible to share this great truth, and, and so should we. But let's come back to that idea, 1 Chronicles 29-25, And the Lord bestowed on Solomon royal majesty, which had not, not been on any king before him in Israel. But we know in Luke 11, 11.31, there's a note. The queen of, of the south will rise up with the men of, the, of this generation at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. And we know that was a reference to Jesus himself. A greater king has arisen. A king greater than Solomon. A king greater than David. A king which really... is both like Solomon and David. David was a, a man of war, a man who fought his enemies and destroyed them. Solomon is a king of peace. And what is Christ as king? He's, he's a man of peace. But he's also going to be the one who comes to set all things right and to fight against unrighteousness. That's what we see in the book of Revelation. And this messianic principle was there for example, in Isaiah 9, 6, as we transition from Thanksgiving and we transition into our Christmas season, think about what we see here in 1 Chronicles. This idea of the Davidic covenant, God has established a king and a kingdom and a throne that is eternal, that will go on forever and ever, and only one man can truly fulfill that, and that was Christ Himself. And God prophesied that. Through Isaiah the prophet, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So part of God's plan was to bring about this eternal king who would rule over Israel. Now we also know in Isaiah that king would also be the suffering servant. And that king came. Luke chapter 1, 31 through 33. And speaking to Mary, the angel said, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. The same throne that we've been speaking about here in 1 Chronicles, that literal physical throne, will be the throne that is occupied by the great King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And the chronicler is, is providing that part of history as far as the establishment of this kingdom, of this throne. And again, we come into the Gospels and we see the birth of Christ to, to be able to be that king, to sit on the throne, but we know there is a postponement. The people rejected him. We see the establishment of the church, but he comes back. When? We don't know. So Merry Christmas. Think about the eternal King of Kings. That when he has come, he's come as a baby. A poor baby, a humble baby. And he died as the suffering servant, just like Isaiah said. 
And he's waiting. He's sitting on, or he's sitting at, I won't say on, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting to take the throne of David. And that time will come when he comes back. Well, he will destroy unrighteousness and he will sit on that throne here physically, literally on earth. Just a continuation of that program that we've studied in First Chronicles. So we went through a lot of names, we went through a lot of genealogies, a lot of history. But again, it's all part of God's plan as He's carrying it forward. And it's a significant part of what we wait for. We've seen here in First Chronicles the establishment of it, the foundation of it. So let's pray. Father, we thank You for another day. We thank You for this time. We thank You for our study of First Chronicles and just pray You teach, teach us, write these truths in our hearts and we live them out. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.